Across the wide and lonesome prairie, the Oregon Trail Diary of Hattie Campbell, pages 44 through 52. Written by Christiana Gregory. Read by Christina Grieve. Next day. It's mid-morning and we are still camped. There is so much upset and noise that I am alone in our wagon for a few moments. No one can see me because I'm hidden among the flower sacks. Wish I could disappear for good. When Pa said the word hemlock, panic broke out. Folks who hadn't eaten yet suddenly thought they had. Mothers cried for their children. Suddenly I remembered Cassia. We called her name. Gideon found her curled up alongside his family's wagon. When I saw him, carrying her limp body in his arms. And when I realized she was dead, I broke down. Only two bites. I sobbed. It was only two bites. Three graves are being dug by the side of the trail. The two younger boys died 30 minutes after becoming sick. Wade hasn't woke up yet. His eyes just staring and, and his his body stiffens and shakes so widely, they've had to tie him down so he won't hurt himself. Peppa's too upset to speak. It crushed me to look at Wade. His breathing hard and fast through clenched jaws so it sounds like he's hissing. Blood is at the corner of his mouth. I have never seen such, such a violent sickness. What happened was the boys were so hungry, they sampled the vegetables while waiting for supper. We don't know how much hemlock Wade ate, but we're praying it ain't as much as the others. He was the only one whose jaws they were able to pry open long enough for him to swallow. Maybe charcoal in his stomach is absorbing the poison. There is much weeping. Peppa and I showed the men where we found the plants. We are going to show them to everyone, walking from wagon to wagon, telling children to be careful, to stay away and not even touch them if they find any while out playing. Pa said at first, there is a sweet taste when you take a bite, but then there is a bit of burning taste. Carrots and parsnips, he showed us, by drawing in the dirt, have one root. That's what they are a root. Hemlock has a few roots joined together, like a hand with plump fingers. The color is white, just like parsnips and wild carrots. Even the tops are deadly. Sheep and cattle die from grazing on them. Uncle Tim said that one small root can kill a horse. One bite can kill a man. He showed us that when you cut hemlock, it drips with an oily, yellow goo. The other thing is the roots are hollow with rungs, like rungs in a ladder. <sighs> I'm sick to think I didn't know these things. Later, we have pulled out and left behind that terrible camp along the Platte. Gideon and Mr. Lewis, Wade's father, carved the children's names onto a plank of wood, along with a warning, and placed it by the graves. The funeral was unbearable. Oh, the tears. We stood with Cassia's parents and sisters. The boys' families also had many aunts, uncles, and brothers and cousins. A lone fiddler played Amazing Grace as men shoveled dirt in, onto the common grave. Moments later, the sun set, spreading gold and purple across the wide flowing river. I ached, something fierce. Mrs. Anderson looked at me with eyes full of sorrow, then gently brushed my cheek before turning away. Later, when the stars were out and no one could see me, I ran into the brush and I fell down weeping. My heart was broken. Everyone says I'm not to blame, but, but I still feel dead inside. It's a miracle no one else ate them vegetables. Wade seems to sleep, but his eyes are open and he mumbles words we don't understand. They gave him a sip of rum this morning, which has made his arms and jaw relax. 
And Peppa lifts a spoonful of water to his lips every half hour and rubs her finger along his throat. So, so we'll swallow. He must have bitten his cheek because there is still blood in his mouth. Our mothers pray. They are asking God that if it be his will to please, he'll wade. I look over at the Anderson's wagon and start crying again. There are half as many diapers pinned to their canvas top. Ma said there's nothing worse than losing a child and to leave behind the grave never to see it again is an unspeakable pain. Lord, please don't let Wade die. I don't know what day this is. We crossed the South Platte. I've not felt like writing until now. The river is near a mile wide and so shallow lots of folks walk across. This is a great relief to me. Peppa and I challenged Gideon and some other boys to a race, but we soon, we were slowed. We were slowed down by our wet skirts. When Gideon saw us struggling to run in the waist high water, he stepped between us, took our hands and helped to pull us across. It was the first time any of us had laughed for two days. Once ashore, we flopped down in the warm sand and stared up at the sky. It was such a lovely blue, I felt for that moment happy again. While Peppa and I wrung out our hams, Gideon turned away, embarrassed to see our bare legs. He is the nicest of all the boys we've met except for Wade. I feel sad Wade's been sleeping these two days. His mama keeps a damp cloth over his eyes so he won't go blind. Later. Now that we're in the North Platte River Valley, the air feels dry and thin. My lips are so chapped they bleed when I talk. The only thing to do is dip our fingers into the bucket of axle grease and rub our lips every hour or so. It smells bad. It tastes bad. And the blowing dust sticks. It feels like we must be halfway to Oregon, but tall Joe says no. We've only gone 500 miles. He also said the worst part of the trails to come. Does he mean more rivers to cross? Will there be Indians? I'm afraid to ask what he's talking about. The Anderson's wagon had an accident when we climbed up Windlass Hill and were heading down the other side. It was so steep that at the top of the, of the hill, we unhitched the, the teams and led them down separately. Then we chained the wheels to keep them from turning. Also, we cut small trees and tied them behind each wagon for drag to slow it down as men lowered them with ropes and pulleys. That is why this place is named Windlass Hill. It took hours and hours. I was nervous watching the men strain so hard. The heels dug into sand, the palms bleeding from the ropes. Ma and some other ladies tore their petticoats into rags to wrap around the men's hands. What happened with the Anderson wagon is that their front axle hit a stump, which caused a smaller rope to snap. Before anyone could help, the wagon flipped over and over and over, landing in splinters at the bottom. Folks screamed, but it was just sh such a shock of seeing such an accident. No one was hurt. Thank God Mrs. Anderson and her daughters were watching from the top of the hill, for they had climbed out earlier to lighten the load. The only belongings they could rescue were clothes and blankets that were strewn over rocks when their trunks split open and a few tools. Aunt June and Uncle Tim right away invited the family to share their own wagon and supplies for the rest of the journey. We will also share. Hazel, Holly, Laurel, and Olive will take turns riding with us. I don't mind giving up my very small spot inside as it's hot from the sun beating down on the, that canvas top. And I'm tired of the bumping and rattling. Besides, something's always t tipping over. Yesterday, it was Mom's bureau. Things are packed in so tight that the bouncing makes the ropes fray. My opinion is it ain't safe in there. Two other wagons got stumped today, so those families will double up with others. There's enough wreckage to completely build a new rig. 
but no time to do it. We must keep moving. The mules and oxen will go to others who need them. After supper, Gideon came over to, to where Peppa and I were sitting. He nodded to me, then looked shyly at Peppa. Won't you please dance with me? He asked. Peppa leaned over to whisper in my ear. Do you mind, Hattie? I turned to whisper in her ear. He's handsome. She smiled and squeezed my hand. So there they are, circling the fire with the other dancers, shuffling, stepping, turning, his left hand on his hip, his right hand around her waist. Folks watch them and smile. I wish Wade was well enough to ask me to dance. Ash Hollow. The Platte split into two, so now our trail is along the North Platte River. Our reward for making it down. Wind, Wind Last Hill is the most beautiful campsite yet. It's called Ash Hollow because of so many thick, shady ash trees. There's a spring with fresh icy water so we can fill up our barrels and such. Everywhere we look, there's firewood and good pastures for the animals. It's so peaceful, Ma said. Oh, Charles, can't we stay here forever? A few years ago, some immigrants did that exactly. A family built themselves a cabin and plowed a field. They are friendly to us and have offered to post our letters with the next travelers heading back to Missouri. Many of us quick wrote to friends. I tore out a sheet of paper from this journal and sent Becky a drawing of hemlock telling her all. The moon is so full I'm writing this. I'm writing by its light, and as I sit near the wagon, there are hundreds of campfires tonight and singing. Ma is walking along the creek with Mrs. Anderson, who has been silent for days. Ma says she's grieving, that she finally realizes that little Cassia is gone, and that her grave is far away in a lonely place along a, along a river she'll never see again. I'm so very sad for her. This makes me watch Benny and Jake more close, for I don't know how Ma and Pa and me could go on if they become became lost or, or died somehow. There are Indians, about twenty, camped nearby. The sight of them makes me so nervous, I feel vomity. Some women came near, holding their hands out, talking in their language. Their deerskin dresses have tiny beads sewn along their sleeves. Their hair is braided over their shoulders. One of them wore a basket on on her back with a baby inside, a, a dark haired baby with, with dark quiet eyes. They accepted Ma's corn cakes with, without a smile. I asked Tall Joe why they were, they was begging. They ain't begging, he said. Indians are hospitable people. And if, if they was passing through our land, they'd give us a gift. They're just asking for ours. They look like beggars to me, but they are not making trouble. Matter of fact, one of the women did something real nice. She saw Mrs. Anderson off by herself crying and walked over to her with a square de deer skin the size of a plate. On it was several chunks of cooked meat. She picked up a piece and put it to Mrs. Anderson's lips, nodding for her to eat. The woman then pointed to the little Anderson girls playing in the stream, then motioned with her hands and mouth like she was eating. Finally, Mrs. Anderson accepted the gift. I think she understood that the Indian woman wanted her to take nourishment for the sake of, of her little daughters.